Greetings to all the customers. Hola! We're in Brazil. We're going to make the national dish of Brazil. So this one's a few my little Brazilian friend, Lazita. That's it. Right. Uh, it's quite a long process. So actually we're quite early. And even though we're in Brazil, so technically we're sort of on holiday, it could be beer time, but it's a bit early. Now you can cook this dish in a slow cooker, we're not, we're going to do it in the Dutch oven as they call it, casserole pot, whatever. And that back a bit, what we're going to do, we basically we're going to do a little bit of prep and then it's going to cook away for a couple of hours and then we sort of finish off by doing a bit extra. So, what are we cooking? We're cooking the classic black bean and meat stew if you like feijoada again my pronunciation is probably shite but that's what it is feijoada and for that we're going to want certain meats now can't get any of the actual brazilian meat one of the things they would have is um and like a, a salted um air dried salted beef carne seca or seca can't get any so what i've got here is some beef and all i'm going to do at this stage is is just a rather large lump of fat in there i'm just going to remove that but i'm not going to worry about trimming it because at this stage we're just doing a bit of cooking so i've put it's about 300 plus grams of beef okay And then uh, the next thing we want is um, some smoked calabresa or brazy, I don't know, sausage. Um, now that's, a, that's like a smoked pork sausage. Can't get any of that. So what we've got instead is about 230 grams of kielbasa. In that goes. Again we'll be chopping all this up later and then the other meat that goes in it is another sausage uh, this one is hayo sausage um, it's a traditional smoked portuguese and um, again couldn't find that so what you do instead is you have about 120 british grams of chorizo in that goes now all we're going to do at this stage is cover it in water bring it up to the boil and boil it um, I'll have to have a little bit more water that boil it for about 20 minutes now part of the reason we're doing this is because if you use the traditional meat the traditional meat the traditional meat does um, have a lot of salt in it. so what you would have done is soaked it overnight in the fridge in some water preferably switching the water out draining it off three times during that time um, and then this is a, like a final stage where we're going to cook this and then we're going to remove the meat and that hopefully should remove any salt so it's not really essential being that we haven't got a salted meat so the only other things you're going to want are black beans. Now I've had black beans soaking overnight, so they're there ready to go. Um, put them in the fridge, cover them in cold water and leave them in the fridge. I've just drained them. Um, you're going to need a, a half a large onion. I've got two small ones, by the time I've trimmed them that'll be enough. A whole orange, although I'm only actually going to use half of it the first bit. Uh, some garlic and some bay leaves. And then you're going to need some back bacon. Now, in the case of the back bacon, we don't worry about removing excess fat and we don't worry um, about the saltiness. All right, so all we're going to do, like I say, first stage that's going to cook for 20 minutes. So our meat's been boiling away for 20 odd minutes, and what we're going to do now is just remove it and 
that was all. Went on my foot. And in my eye. Um, what we're going to do is we're just going to chuck all this water away. Um, you've got all that scum and some of the fat that's come out there. Um, and then the beef we're going to be putting back in in a minute. The sausages uh, will we uh, will delay that a little bit. So there's the rest of me meat. Ooh, the meat's already falling apart. That's going to come out. Bet that splits just as I'll get it over there. Well, no, it's all right. So, like I say, I'm now just going to drain that and then we'll start our next stage of boiling. We're going to put our meat, the beef, back in there for now. We're going to add our drained beans. Um, I've got four bay leaves here. And then I'm going to take an orange and I'm just going to split that orange and put half in it. Now, uh, final thing is then we're now just going to cover it with plenty of water and we're going to bring this up to the boil. And I'll probably want to put a little bit more water in there. We're going to bring this up to the boil and then we're going to let that then simmer away. Trying to get that onion, uh, onion, that orange down in there, but you don't want to go down. So, like I say, we're now just going to let that come back up to the boil, and then we're going to boil that, or simmer that, for 30 minutes, at which point we'll be ready to start adding the meat back in. So, we've still got. Um, our onion, our garlic and our back bacon to do okay but we'll worry about that when um, when we're near the finish of the cooking to be honest. So what is feijoada? Now basically it comes from the word feijoa again the pronunciation is right isn't it uh, which basically means bean in Portuguese. It was traditionally prepared in a sort of clay pot over low heat um, and like I said, it's, it's the national dish. And in fact, there are some restaurants that have a lot of a feijoada day. Um, now, where did it come from? It's traditionally a Brazilian dish, but it's actually Portuguese origin. So 30 minutes, can you bubble it away nicely? Gonna take that lid off for the moment. That the lid didn't get stuck to that. Now, um, at this point, we're now going to add in them sausages, and you can see the well. You can't. Well, perhaps you can. It's turning quite black from the uh, the beans. You might ask, well, why the orange? Well, um, traditionally, you put the orange in there. The idea being the orange absorbs the extra fats that might be in there. Now whether that's true or not, who knows. So we're now just going to put the lid on, back on and now we're going to cook that on a nice low simmer, hour and a half. Um, and then we'll be coming back and adding the rest of the ingredients. So I was telling you a little bit about you know where did it come from. Um, the originally, what you would have had as part of the like the sausage or the pork that went in it was like the trimmings of a pig. So like the ears, the feet, the head, perhaps. And the story goes that this is what the Brazilians, um, sorry, the sort of slavers, the slaves, sorry, not slavers, the slaves that were brought over to the Brazil, Basically, um, their masters every now and again would give them, you know, the crappy bits of the pig. And so that's why they ended up adding that to their bean stew. Because the masters were saying, there you go, you can have them crappy bits of pork or the pig, I don't want that. There is one drawback to that. Because back then, um, sort of during the 15th, 16th, 17th centuries, 
those bits of a pig were actually considered delicacies. So it's highly unlikely the masters, as it were, would be saying to their slaves, you're going to have them best bits. And what is more likely is that it is, it is just an adaptation of a pork and vegetable stew that came from um, Portugal because Brazil was invaded by the um, Portuguese and so they adopted a lot of the Portuguese um, ways, if you like, including their cuisines. Um, Portugal, the Portuguese, probably got it originally from the Romans um, because the Romans um, basically would make a very similar dish. So that's sort of the origin of the feijoada. I have to keep saying it because otherwise I forget how to say it. Um, now, when we finally finish cooking and serving it, traditionally it would be served with some boiled rice, slices of our orange, hence some reason I'm keeping my orange, the other half of the orange there, um, and sort of greens, shredded and cooked greens. We're probably just going to have it as a stew with a, a little bit of orange. So, well, actually, it said almost two. So what I'm just going to do temporarily is just turn uh, that off. Where's my thingy gone? Um, getting a bit wild now. I'm just going to remove that lid. I moved it onto the back burner because I'm going to want this front burner in a minute. And what the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to remove. I'm going to remove my meat. I'm also going to remove the orange, and we'll be throwing the orange away. And if I can find them. I'm going to throw away the what's names as well, bay leaves, something like that. So here we are. Ooh. In our, uh, oh, there's one in Brazil. I've got to find me meat yet. Oh, there's another one. Put four in, didn't I? Um, there's one of the steaks. I've just seen another bay leaf. Now we're going to let this meat cool a little bit because I can find some meat down here, I can feel it. Ooh. So you can see how that meat actually is nice and tender because that beef is falling apart. Um, so I might not actually have to do much in the way of chopping. Just going to trim the onions and then we're just going to chop them up. So Brazilian music, or well, Brazilian music is like a um, fusion, if you like, of European um, sort of Amerindian, um, African, because remember um, the slave trade, um, a lot of slaves in Brazil, and they've since then developed their own styles. So probably most people think of uh, Brazilian music as like the samba. Ew, that was moldy. It's brand new garlic. Well, I said brand new. They just bought it from the supermarket yesterday. Moldy money in there. Um, samba, bossa nova, and actually um, quite a big old gospel, gospel funk on that. So, I said to you it was a bit of a, a fusion of all these different styles from when they sort of, you know, got taken over by the Portuguese when the sort of slavers started arriving and that sort of thing. Um, but obviously it does have its traditional roots. <laughs> Just that top young by the way. Um, when they, they first arrived, the settlers and that, into um, Brazil, and came across you know, the rainforest people. Croaking frog. Now, I'm not saying they had croaking frogs like this. This looks almost more Incan to me. But anyway, um, what they found was that peop the people were using flutes, whistles, horns, drums, and rattles. So perhaps they had croaking frogs as well, I don't know. And actually, there is a link to the croaking frog because 
the music they created was meant to represent the sounds of the rainforest around them. Quaking forest. That was a bit of a dodgy quote, mate. So, um, that was sort of the origin. Wait, hang on. What's in here? Well, actually, I don't know why I put it in here, because it can escape. Let me get it out. There you go. That's a sassy. Potentially very dodgy. I'll tell you about that when we finish talking about the music. Um, I'll put him up there laying down there. He's only got one leg. If I lay him down, he can't do much. Well, he can. Um, actually, I better be careful. Now I've upset him, he chop my bloody hand off. You'll see why in a minute. Um, so, um, this is where sort of like the original music was from, but then like I say, the Brazilians gradually adapted different styles. By the way, um, when this goes out, it'll be winter. Winter, or certainly autumn. And it's, I'm actually doing this in the height of British summer. Planned all this, and of course, we're now in yet another mega heat wave. So, I'm stuck in this kitchen, got to keep the door bloody shut because bleeding flies. And it's baking hot. And on top of that, we're having a nice hot stew. Mock me brow. So, um, Jesuit missionaries went into the, um, wash me hands, uh, went into the, uh, obviously, the forest and that to try and, actually, um, I'm going to use my garlic press with the garlic. So anything I've got to do here is I've got some bacon. Um, and like I said to you, um, the bacon is one of those meats that we don't want to bother um, cutting the fat off. We're going to get the fat out of that. Um, we're also not adding, which going to the subject a bit, I know at a minute, uh, we're not going to be adding any salt um, because um, obviously if we were using the correct um, meats, um, they are very salty anyway, so you wouldn't normally, I might like leave them bits of bacon, um, you want three large or thick slices of ba ba bacon, um, but you know this is just ordinary bacon the best we can get. Um, and I run out of beer, I did sneak a couple of wife's cold lagers, but I'm having to go back on the red. Um, so, the Jesuit missionaries introduced, well, obviously they were trying to introduce Christianity. And one of the things, um, obviously, they did was introduce songs. Which were, <coughs> slice me orange by the way, um, which were often um, done in the Tolpi language, which was like the local language. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to put some heat on that. I'll put a little bit of oil in there because the first thing we're going to do is we're going to fry that bacon. Now we can fry that bacon to make that a bit crispy. Okay, which is what we're going to do. Uh, so um, they use their own Christian lyrics, but they did it in the native language. Um, but also introduced the Gregorian chant and then the more modern looking flute and the bow in the harpsichord, or clavichord, sorry, not the harpsichord. Um, so that was sort of like the original origin. Now there's a, a there is a type of music, uh, maracatu, uh, which is an Afro-Brazilian traditional music. And actually it's often found in parades and things like that, because it harks back to the days of the slaves who amongst their own community used to elect their own king of the slaves, if you like, and they would hold ceremonies and things like that. This is during the colonial times. Um, and the original, perhaps kings of Congo, were now slaves, but they became the kings of the, of the slaves there. And this music was paid in a sort of like um, homage to them, if you like. So we've got to remember that 
I don't touch the handles on it because they'll be fucking hot. Oh, better have a drink to remind me. So what I'm going to do, I'm now just going to chuck that bacon in there and start frying it up. And like I say, a little bit, little bit crispy. So that was the maracatu. Um, and what I said to you earlier, now like I say, we're going to cook this for a few minutes until it starts going brown. Although just remember, this is British bloody bacon full of lean water. Um, so it probably won't brown very easily because of the moisture that come out of it. Um, so samba. So samba um, is probably the most common um, form of Brazilian music, or most known. And mainly because of like Brazilian carnival and how they do the samba. Although from the 50s onwards, bossa or bossa nova has obviously become much more predominant. So I'm now just going to add that onion. Um, and we're also going to put that garlic in there. Obviously I'm going to mince that garlic up. Now don't be frightened about putting too much garlic in. There wants to be plenty of garlic in this. I know I generally chuck extra garlic in because I like garlic. Um, at the end of the day, in this case, it does have a lot of garlic. Because this dish, although it can be a bit salty, isn't particularly spicy. Um, really the only one thing it has in it is it's um, garlic. So, uh, bosa nova, bosa nova, I don't know. Um, essentially, um, it was sort of like a slower samba type beat um, that a lot of people sort of quite liked. Um, it sort of become introduced into the Ipanema and uh, beach neighbourhoods and things like that and became very, very popular. And of course, one of the classic sort of Bosa Nova um, hits, if you like, um, is the girl from Ipanema. So now all we're going to do now, we're just going to fry this up for a little bit together. And then once we've softened up that onion, hopefully brown that bacon a little bit more, that will go in the stew pot. Still can't find that other bacon. Perhaps it's too stuck together now. Um, and then all we've got left to do is prepare the meat to put back in there and then there'll be a little bit more cooking um, and that's it. So that in, in a nutshell, I mean obviously it's far more to it than just that little bit, that was a little bit of about the music of uh, Brazil. But what I haven't told you yet is about our little sarsi here and I've got to be careful with him. Actually, I meant to say, um, what we're going to do is we're going to, going to take some of that beans, or some of those beans, um, that we've drained. Okay, it's a bit of meat, we'll bake it. Um, we don't want the liquid, we just want to take some of them beans out of that liquid. And then transfer it. There's the bailiff. Got you, your bugger. I knew he was in there. Um, so like I say, we don't want, really want the liquid in there. Throwing all the rest away. But what we do want to do with the beans that we've got in here, and I might add a little bit more in a minute, is just mash it up. The idea being, just to be annoying, um, the idea being uh, we want to sort of release some of the starches because that will help, even though it's getting pretty much like that in there anyway, um, that will help slightly thicken our stew a little bit because there's still a lot of liquid in there. I'm just going to add some more beans. So, earlier, when I burnt myself, right near that beginning, and it splashed, and I've got boiling water, boiling stock, if you like, in my eye, on my foot. So I've got like, flip flops on. I'm a bazoom, when I? Um, that was probably his fault, the sarsi. He's a one-legged little limp who's a pain in the arse. Who can be a pain in the arse. Equally, he can be really good. But um, he's a, a fay from Brazilian folklore. Right, I'm just going to mash this a little bit. Um, and then, like I say, what we're now going to do, and I'm going to either pick that up in that or use a glove, uh, we're then going to chuck that into that pot. Just going to do a little taster 
and see if we do need to add any salt. We're going to add a bit of pepper, but we'll see if we need to add any salt. It's not particularly salty at all. So I might add a little bit of Himalayan pink salt. Don't be near Brazil, but there you go. Um, and we can, like I say, I'll add some black pepper. So this fairy, if you like, he's a one-legged black, black man who wears a red cap, smokes a pipe, and basically he's the cause of most people's woes. It can be useful at times. Just going to stir that in. Um, but he's only tiny. But for a tiny little fairy, he can be a gigantic pain in the arse. Wait, see what I mean? He tried to dive in me meat then, contaminate me meat. He can be very dangerous. He can just be a little bit mischievous. He can, under certain circumstances, be quite helpful. Uh, but that's only if you can capture him. So, people used to say when the milk got spilt, well, if the milk turned sour when you were milking your cows, or if the seamstress dropped a few stitches and whatever, um, if you smash something in the kitchen, if you boiled it over, Sarsi's at fault. It's Sarsi. He's a pain in the ass. He likes to think he's being mischievous, but he's not really. Anyway, um, while I'm telling you a little bit more, what we're going to start doing is chopping this meat up. So, um, this beef probably isn't going to need an awful lot of chopping up because it's literally falling apart. Um, and what we're going to do is just chop it up. Like I say, this is literally just falling to bits. So it doesn't really need an awful lot. And then what we're going to do is chuck that back in the pot. Okay. So, um, people used to blame Sarsi on everything. So, um, he was quite often found as the cause of dust devils, which you know you get in Brazil. Um, they argued he had this, even though he was only one legged, he was pretty agile and he could spin on this one leg to such an extent he could he, he would create a dust devil. Missy's just appeared, she wants a drink, so I better stop here and pause so that she can do. Don't want to get alongside the missus. Just chopping up the uh, sausages, I've done the chorizo that's gone in there. Just chopping up the kielbasa or whatever. Um, so, I was telling you about the sarsi. So he would create these little dust devils um, while spinning really, really fast. And that obviously made him a bit more difficult to fight see because he'd be inside this dust devil. But he could, he did have the power of invisibility. Although often, his red cap would still be visible. So he wasn't really invisible then, was he? And not only that, um, his red cap would be visible and um, his pipe, because he used to smoke a pipe. But if you could grab his cap, if you get his cap off him, that's where his secret powers were. So he immediately was enslaved to you. Or if you could sneak up on the dust devil with a sieve, we are talking Brazil here, um, with a sieve, um, you could like sieve him out of the dust devil and you whacked him in a dark, um, dark amber or gla um, green glass bottle whacked a cork in top, put a cross on top, and he was trapped. He was a genie in a bottle. So, just keep an hold of him for a minute. So I don't want him bubbling up my stew. So all we're gonna do is just heat this for about another 15 minutes, obviously get that meat, you know, nice and hot again. Also hopefully thicken up our stew, but you can see there's a lot here. This is made for four people, okay? Um, obviously, they would generally make a much bigger pot. But anyway, going back to our sarsi, um, if you have one of these chasing you, and I can say he was bloody quick, and you want to get away from him because of the, what he'd do to you if he got in near you. Um, so, how did you escape? Well, if you're running away from him, 
which he was betting didn't run away from. Um, if you cross or jumped over a stream, he couldn't chase you. Because um, if he crossed water, he lost all his powers. So if there was a river or stream about, get across it. Um, the other thing you could do, you're running along and thinking, oh shit, there's no rivers about. Oh, I know, I've got this length of rope in my pocket. And you quickly tie lots of knots in it, and then you drop it and run off. And the sassy will get up to that knotted rope. Oh my fucking God, I've got to undo them knots. They drive me mad, I can't leave them a knotted rope behind. So you'd sit there trying to undo the knots, and you've got away by him. Very nice this. This is yellow tab, jammy red room. Really like this one. Uh, it's a bit warm, but then again, it's red, it doesn't matter, does it? Um, the other thing you could do, if you didn't have a stream to cross, or you didn't happen to have a length of string or rope in your pocket, but you had your tobacco, drop some tobacco, because then you go, oh, I top my pipe up while I'm here, top his pipe up, forget what he's doing, and you were safe again. But like I said, you could trap him like a genie in a bottle. And then you could say to him, well, I'll let you out, but you let, if I let you out, you've got to grant me some wishes. You've got to be good to me. And so generally, generally, if you did that and let him out, he generally would be nice to you for a little bit. On the other hand, he might be mightily pissed off and it might backfire on you. But this sounds very familiar, doesn't it, to the genie and Aladdin. And it's thought that possibly the origin of Sassy comes from the African slaves who were brought over, who were mainly all Muslim at that time, and as a such, would have known the Arabian tales. So it's quite possible that was the origin of the Sarsi. So let's give this stew a bit of a tasting. It's going to be bloody hot, I know that. So, traditional Brazilian black bean pay shawada the meat certainly cooked I think that's a bit of the beef a bit of bacon a little bit salty I imagine probably if you had the proper meat even if you'd soaked it and drained it it'd probably taste more salty There you go, nice and filling, nice and hearty for a bloody baking hot day. Your Brazilian black bean stew feijoada. Hope that's right, that's here. I'm going to go enjoy this now with the wife. Well, I'm going to enjoy that with the wife. 